Hi, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I'm joined here with um, a good friend who is joining us from across the health, medical, fitness, wellness ecosystem, Dr. Deborah Wong, the co-owner and managing director of Breathe Pilates. Breathe Pilates have an incredible footprint here in Asia. And Dr. Deb, or Deb, should we say, um, Deb not only works here in Singapore, but consults various businesses across health and wellness in Asia. Hi, Deb. Good to see you. Hey, thanks for having me here today. Absolute pleasure. Now, in today's world, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're starting to see at long last the merging of health, fitness and wellness into one large ecosystem. Uh, Deb has a very advantageous position of being able to look across these as both a qualified medical doctor and an owner and advisor to many businesses across the health and fitness ecosystem. Deb, as a doctor, um, maybe a few reflections, first of all, on this pandemic and its impact around the world and its impact, especially here in Asia. I mean, I think we're still in the middle of it right now. So a lot of reflections are still going on. One don't think we've seen um, the end. And, and I think it's hard to predict where things are going. But from what I've seen right now, um, it's very interesting because people tend to revert to what they know. And um, they've gone back to, to what they previously know. So the way that the government is managing stuff and the way a lot of things have been done is actually how they're managing the previous SARS experience. Whether that's right or wrong, I think it's still yet to be seen. Um, as you can tell, I think when we were having this discussion a couple of weeks ago, we didn't even know there was going to be like a second phase two with a heightened alert. We didn't see that coming. So I think in the next couple of months, um, maybe even years, you'll still see it evolving as it happens. Now, you've obviously lived through the SARS and the MERS um, episodes that are here in Asia. Um, they were very much contained in Asia. And I think what we've saw was a, 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 f a quickening of people coming out of those uh, specific pandemics. This pandemic is, is proving a lot longer, um, Deb, and I suppose one of the things that we have been frustrated about, and we talked about this earlier with Greg, was that government are very focused now, not just in Singapore, but in, in multiple countries, on the promotion of safety, of um, hygiene, um, of transmission, rather than perhaps the promotion of health, well-being, nutrition, exercise. Why do you think this has happened in terms of its latency period and do you think that governments will start to again soon promote health over safety i think this is um as you know i mentioned a lot of times when things happen people revert to what they know yeah. and i think that's that's that us being in the wellness scene we kind of live in an echo chamber where we're really used to all this new stuff and we think everyone accepts it but i think what this pandemic has shown is that actually the underlying biases of like the general population and the government and it's shown us exactly where they are in terms of what they think about health and how much work we have to do to bridge that gap um, it's good and bad because now we know where everybody stands and we're not operating from a, you know, a, a standpoint where we think everybody is somewhere else and we're there. <laughs> so we can kind of close the gap now a little bit more. Um, but having said that, I also think that it is a little disappointing because it goes to show that they don't really understand what um, health and um, wellness is and they're still very disease-driven and a very traditional healthcare medical model. And I think the reason for that and the problem for that is that... Um, we, in the last couple of decades, maybe we've gone to like evidence-based medicine, evidence-based um, wellness, which is very difficult to do in a wellness setting. It's hard to do like randomized, double-blind control trials for fitness and nutrition and um, overall well-being and mental health. How do you think we as an industry, the, the wellness, the fitness industry, how can we close that gap? Um, and understand how we can become an essential service. I think that's where we want to become, right? We want to try and be seen as an essential service as part of a preventative healthcare measure, rather than perhaps um, a, a liability, a threat, to which, is, which many governments see us. What do we have to do? We can always point the finger at government and understand that the blame lies with them, but I think we also have to take full note that we've, we as an industry have never really helped in that situation. How can we help, Deb? How can we be seen as an essential service? Where I come from is a little bit different because Pilates is a little bit more wellness as yep. opposed to like fitness. And I, and I think fitness probably has a bigger challenge than we do. Um, right now, the government does see f essential services, as, you know, like physiotherapy, you know, even, I, even chiropractors and osteopaths are sort of 
a bit more recognized nowadays, even traditional Chinese medicines. You can see during phase one, they kind of allowed acupuncture and all these other things. And they're starting to understand that. And for us, it's a Pilates studio because we can work with these professionals and we have in-house physiotherapists and, and um, doctors that actually work with us. We're a little bit more into that area. So I think one way the fitness can do it is to team up more with the healthcare industry. And I think it's com convincing the doctors themselves about how to work and prescribe fitness as a, as a treatment modality. And that's when the government and the public as well will be kind of educated into our essential, essentialness of it. Absolutely. Um, let's look at work-life balance. Um, I know that you've recently had a, a baby and congratulations. Um, I'm sure that you are enjoying motherhood, if not the, the broken sleep. Um, but this pandemic, of course, it's made us all appreciate home, I think, an awful lot more. There's been a work from home culture. Um, how do you think that's going to play out this environment of people being at home more? Um, how will that affect their health? How will that affect their well-being? I think it's funny because people think work from home gives you more work-life balance. But if you think about it, the amount of work doesn't change. The only thing that you're saving on is your commute time. Because you, you should be doing the same amount of thing at home as you are at work, technically. Um, so what I think is the biggest problem is that people can't differentiate between like work and home work and home life. It's very hard because that physical distancing and the ability to kind of like leave your space to go into another space helps you change your hate space quite a bit. And I think our spaces are not designed for that. And, you know, especially in a city like Singapore or throughout Asia, really, everything is very small, very pot like. And, and I think you've seen that in like rental and property trends, right? People are actually trying to move out and buy more stuff um, because they feel like, oh, I can't do this work from home in such a small space anymore. So I actually think work from home is very challenging. Yeah, you do save on your commute time, though, so that's an extra two, three hours that is great that you can add to your family time. But people need to have a lot more discipline, and I think that's why people find that they're not as productive because you get that mental fatigue from having to be disciplined. You have to, to create these boundaries for yourself. How have you found it? How have you had success in the past 12 months in keeping those spaces separate? Has it been discipline? Uh, has it been routine, ritual? What has it been? It was a lot easier when I didn't have a son. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot easier before I had a baby. So it's interesting because I actually did the last circuit breaker without a baby. And then this one, I have a child. So, so, so the, the difference is, is quite huge. And I, and I really think everybody with children and home-based learning, it's a whole different ball game altogether as compared to if you didn't have a job. Um, but I think what it is, is we're lucky enough to have separate spaces. I have an office that I can kind of like, so I go into my office and that physical act of going into a space that's designed for work is much easier and definitely helps as well. But still, I'm still trying to find a balance really. Now, a lot of your clients, of course, um, they're recovering from injury, they're recovering from disease themselves. Um, no doubt it's quite traumatic for them. What are some of their needs and requirements out the back of this? Are you finding that when you're treating these clients, obviously they have um, physical needs, but is there maybe some mental challenges, mental health challenges because they're isolated, because they're perhaps rehabilitating injured? What are your thoughts on how your clients are changing their needs? Um, so when you, you deal with clients, if like when you're rehabilitating, especially in a high, like I feel like in a high stress environment like that, you don't really want to add on more cortisol. You don't want to push them even further. And then sometimes people do take a step back, but it's just you just have to remind them that that's part of the process and part of the progress, and just be really patient with it. Um, I mean, we're, we're in Pilates and we're in wellness. And I think with the low intensity exercise, I think it's great that they're mm -hmm. offering that now because people really don't need that extra sympathetic drive right now, given all the external kind of pressures on them. And it won't make them feel as good, I think, as if you were able to connect with them and meet them where they are. And I think because our, our business is centered such on small groups and you know individuals, it's a little easier to tailor to that. Are you seeing more demand for Pilates as a whole? It is such a fast growing market segment. And I suppose coming back to your point, it was medical and, and, and wellness and, and well-being, but now there's definitely elements of fitness in it. I mean, how big a marketplace is Pilates becoming? It's definitely picked up. So um, Breathe was uh, started 10 years ago, and it's def we've definitely seen a lot of growth in the last 10 years. People used to not know what Pilates is at all, and now everyone knows what it is. And I think, um, you know, like the test is when you speak to someone off the, you know, in the, in the supermarket or something, and they ask you what you do, and they actually know what it is, and then that's when you know that it's taken off. So there, there, is, there is definitely growth in that area. A lot of people still can't differentiate yoga and Pilates, though, <laughs> so that's something we have to work on. Um, yeah, 
What was the question again? We should go back. Uh, no, where, where do you see it growing to? Obviously, there's okay. so much demand coming in. Um, and to your point, I think people now recognise it. They're aware of the benefits. Um, do you see it as a, as a, as a sector that's perhaps going to go more and more mainstream? We actually did see a lot of growth uh, from the last period um, from the circuit breaker end to now. So we're very thankful for that. Um, people are just um, more willing to try out new things. And I think we're one of the companies that have actually seen growth during this period. So we're really quite thankful for that. And I think that's a cross board for most Pilates studios, I would say. So yes, I think there is, there is growth and there is potential. Um, I'm more interested in the wellness area of it and how we can work with uh, medical professionals, like I mentioned, to yep. just kind of make us a little bit more essential. And we've looked into integrating our services a bit more, providing a more um, holistic kind of approach, you know, and see how we can work. It's something we've always wanted to work on for the last 10 years, but it's been challenging because of the market. They don't really understand that yet. But this is an opportunity for us to capitalize on that. Do you think we're getting close or are we still quite far away from uh, a general practitioner, a normal GP actually prescribing Pilates treatment um, as a as something instead of medicine. How, how far do you think removed are we from people prescribing wellness activities, fitness activities as part of a solution? I think it's getting better and it'd be surprising that the people who do refer are the people who have done it themselves, of course, because mm. they understand that you have to experience the benefits. It's, it's not something that can be just taught down. Um, so you get our clients, a lot of them who are like doctors, they'll be the ones who uh, understand you know, the kind of benefits that it does and they'll be the ones who refer them to us. So actually, we have to do more marketing, just <laughs> consumer <laughs> marketing to get people into the door <laughs> and then that's how the medical doctors will refer to us. Now, we talked on earlier on, ladies and gentlemen, about the whole, um, the evolving workspace. I mean, who knows where we're going to be in 12 months' time in terms of are we going to have more or less physical space at our offices? Are people who own properties going to have more or less properties? It's a very uncertain market. You happen to lease out a number of properties um, for your studios. Um, Deb, what are your thoughts in terms of, as a business owner who has a number of leases, who could potentially take on a number of leases? Are, are you seeing more potential, poten uh, sorry, are you seeing more likelihood of you taking virtual classes and virtual elements and trying to reduce your physical overheads? What's your thoughts on what that would look like from a business owner? For us, our virtual, our virtual take up is really not that popular. Um, yeah. it's, it's because our, our I guess you can say a little bit more rehab, a little bit for physical therapy, and, and the word physical is in there, right? So you're not going to go away from that. We're not going to be able to go virtual. We we tried that out during the circuit break. It was uh, a big take up at first. The moment the studios could reopen, it was just like a massive plunge. <laughs> Everyone just wanted to go back into the studio because they're, I think in Pilates, there's the extra element of you being able to, to see and to correct um, and individualize the treatment and, and people understand that and are willing to pay for that. So it's very hard for us to go virtual and to completely be removed from the physical space. You know, if this is a short term thing, I think we just ride it out. I mean, we, we, we've kind of seen it coming. So we've kind of saved our cash and try to build up a bit of a reserve to buffer for a couple more of these small mini lockdowns. And just to ride it through, we do virtual offerings just to engage our clients and to keep them coming back so that they remember us. But we don't expect to monetize or make that much money or be profitable from it yeah. um, but if this is going to go on for a long time you know like four or five years where we keep having like mini lockdowns over and over again then we would have to rethink our physical footprint um, just we, it, will, it will still be a big component but we might have to think about how are we using our spaces do we want to have so many outlets or do you want to have just one you know where people can come back in yeah. again um, for now, we're just sticking to where we are, but we're, we're, we're keeping an eye on it and, and not um, overly and excitedly jumping into, into new, new things. Now, we touched on it with Brad just in the last interview, ladies and gentlemen. Um, how do you invest in, in the experience? How are you trying to build a better experience for your clients? What are your thoughts in terms of you know, your traditional client coming into a Breathe Pilates studio for for a treatment, how can you enhance that experience? Have you maybe had any reflections throughout the pandemic, Deb, where you're thinking, actually, we could work, we could tweak this to become better? So actually now it's a really good time during the off time. We're really working very, very hard on our ops and our, and our marketing to just kind of cement the backbone behind it. Because if your company grows, and, and I think during growth phases, they keep growing and keep growing and you don't clean up the house. And, 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 and then it's not a good foundation. And so we're really taking the time now to kind of clean it up, build up the operation system. Um, 
we've grown to the point where I think our customer service is not really keeping up with it. <laughs> so, and so we're, we're just trying to kind of clean it up and fix it. And I think that's a challenge to all businesses face really in Singapore. Um, hiring good customer service and, and making that happen. So we're trying to automate it, you know, create some apps, um, thinking and seeing how we can just cement that so that it's easier to communicate with our clients. It's funny because during this period, you know, it's all in the news, right? And we send out EDMs like almost every day during the last few weeks. We have had people turn up at our studio not knowing that the studio is closed. Wow. And they call us and they'll be like, oh, is my class cancelled? We're like, have you not been watching the TV or something? <laughs> but yeah, so, yeah. What are your thoughts on talent? Because I think there's, you know, it's so important to have the right talent at the right time to grow your business. Um, there are a lot of people who have lost their jobs, sadly, and I think, um, you know, that's not just a situation in Singapore. I think that's, of course, worldwide where people have to make head cut, head, head count cuts. They, you know, they have to shave um, money off their expense bill. Um, people are one of those only options. How can we make sure that more people are coming into our industry, Deb? How can we make sure that we are continually refreshing the talent pool? I think previously, you know, when, so f for myself, previously, um, when travel was not such a big problem, it was much easier to work. I mean, I could work across anywhere in the world, right? I could fly around, you know, um, you, and you can tap into that talent, but now with everything being closed down, I think it's much harder to tap into that global talent. And a lot of people are moving away or to wherever you know they, they feel that they want to be in a lockdown situation. And I think that has challenged our ability to kind of find good talent. But there is a lot of untapped potential, I think, locally. Uh, and what we have done in the last couple of years prior to this was to actually create our own training program. So then you, met, you you can then keep the quality and then you can control that and that's something that is is useful and adds on as like a unique you know thing that your business owns and you really control the identity of your brand as well. So I think good training and in-house training will help us tap into the potential. Um, but I, I think the challenge that we've always had in finding good people is just find us really, not so much the <laughs> talent in the studio, <laughs> but actually um, operations-wise and, and back-end. Okay. Is there is there room for maybe more Pilates training, a course he's coming into the marketplace? I know, of course, there are some maybe um, more world-acclaimed courses out there, but is there perhaps more of a need for medical Pilates coming out? Is there more need for certain types of Pilates trainers, postnatum, for example? What are your thoughts on where those gaps lie? So we've been working on our training program. One of our training program is actually um, just to get new instructors to become more experienced instructors and taking our ex experienced instructors to fill in that gap mm -hmm. to kind of like crystallize their, their knowledge and to help them along the way. That's phase one. And then the second part of our training is actually in rehab. So where we work with the physiotherapists and then the design programs to help our trainers kind of go through every single condition, really know it well. So we're trying to, s to condense experience into something that can be passed down. Um, the rehab part is, is a little slower, and that's what we're working on, but I think that's that's a great area that will also breach that gap and allow the doctors and the government mm. to then therefore trust <laughs> us as, as essential services. Um, what lies ahead for Brief Platys in the next two years? I mean, let's hopefully this will be the last of the, shall we say, many circuit breakers, many lockdowns, assuming that it is, and that we can look ahead to perhaps another couple of years of uh, re-establishing growth, what lies ahead for Brief Pilates? So for us, we're working, um, we, we've been working on our app for the last couple of year, actually a year, a year, we've been working on our app to kind of get ourselves um, to communicate with the customer better, to be able to kind of reach them better, engage them a little bit more. Um, I think our customer really enjoys educational content, but it's very hard to, to talk to them. I mean, obviously, the people don't read their EDMs and don't open their emails, but they always book. So it's one way to try to reach out to them and engage them a little bit better. We're also working on um, uh, franchising um, yeah. regionally, if possible. But I think um, we just have to wait and see how that goes with things opening up. And right now, what we're really focusing on is, like I mentioned, really just cementing our foundation and making sure that everything is ready to go once things are able to grow. So once everything is settled down, we can, once things, you know, like the economy opens up, the market grows, people come and inquire and they grow. So we're all just ready to like kind of take and to train our instructors so that everyone is really equipped to just run right from the start. Um, I one, one question, I'll ask it in two parts. 
Um, what has the last 12 months taught you as a businesswoman that you're going to take forward? And what has the last 12 mo months taught you as a new mother going forward? We'll take the business one. What lessons learned? What positives are you going to take forward? Um, I think with the business, it's one. Th it's really challenging because there's so many things thrown at you. But I think what's really important is to have a really good team. Um, I'm very, very thankful for my team, like the instructors and you know the operations and the marketing people. Everyone's really, really willing to just kind of like do the hours, you know, just suck it up and just be there to support the brand. And so it's really important to hire well people who who trust you and you can work with. It's also one of the other things that I've learned is. Um, how to deal with changes. It's, it's, it can get really overwhelming, but I think it's important to be objective and to step back and, and not let all the negativity kind of just affect you. Yeah. But you do have to take time from that. And I mean, every time they announce these things, I think I probably kind of got really upset for about a week or so and just didn't want to talk to anyone. I was in a bad mood. And uh, just, I think it's fine to give yourself some time to grieve as well, but then to just step back and then move on. 100%. I think people, um, people need space, I think, to take some bad news in. I think when you are... Asking, f asking someone their perspective on bad news directly after they receive bad news, don't expect a good response. I think people have to calibrate it, they have to absorb it and then take it in. Um, okay, and then on the mother front, again, congratulations on your little boy. Um, what have you learned on being a mother in the past 12 months? What lessons are you taking forward? I, well, I mean, like I said, really kudos to people who do home-based learning. And I, my son doesn't even have to go to school, right? But <laughs> so it's still a lot of, a lot of things to be, have a child at home with you full-time while you're trying to work. Um, and I think what's really important is it helps you to understand what really, what really matters. Um, like, you know, what Brad previously said, it's, it's kind of like work is work and then family is family. And you have to really think about what values you, you want to pass on to your child. And I think that has really made me reflect. And in this situation and this environment is really quite a reflective one. I think if we do take the time out, it can expose to you what your real beliefs are, your values are, um, what makes you happy, what makes you sad, what you actually want, why are you so upset during this situation? What is it that you know is triggering it off? Does it is it the loss of your autonomy, loss of freedom? Is it just change? Are you just not adaptable? What is it? Well, look, those are all great questions, are great thoughts to end on, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think the need for us to reflect and the need for us to continuously um, be thankful, be grateful for everything that we've got, and at the same time work together to try and make sure that we're coming out of this um, a stronger, better selves and a stronger, better companies and industry. Uh, Dev, thank you very much for your time today. Lovely speaking with you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll, we'll draw this session to a close and we're back in just one minute with another special guest. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you.